Place a bird feeder in your backyard and before long, cardinals, sparrows, and maybe even hummingbirds will come zipping by. We can take these amazing creatures for granted, but each one represents a stunning solution to aeronautical engineering problems. Does the undirected evolutionary process of natural selection truly explain bird origins? Or does their existence point to an intelligent designer? Coming up on today's edition of Origins, The Genius of Birds with Dr. Paul Nelson. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Our guest today, Dr. Paul Nelson, studied evolutionary theory and the philosophy of science at the University of Chicago. He's currently a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute and adjunct professor in science and religion at Biola University. Paul's been involved in the intelligent design debate internationally for more than two decades. Paul, welcome to the program. Hey, it's great to be here. So we're looking at the genius of birds. Are birds the smartest of the creatures? They are actually remarkably intelligent. In fact, crows have been observed carrying nuts out into the crosswalk of busy streets. They drop the nut, run back to the curb, the traffic passes over the nut, breaks it, they come back out, have themselves a meal. That is intelligent. Yeah. No, the genius that we're going to talk about with respect to birds is the genius of their design. And I want to sketch out a debate that I often find myself in between people like me who endorse intelligent design and I guess you could say the mainstream of evolutionary biology that says, look, it's just not rational to doubt the neo-Darwinian story. I'm going to challenge that. I'll say, no, it is rational to doubt it, and here's why. And my main clue or sort of line of argument will be follow the evidence. So let me give you or describe a response that I often get at professional meetings. I'll be interacting with an evolutionary biologist, and he or she will say, how can you doubt the scholarly consensus that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs, which is the standard theory right now? And how can you doubt that this happened by an undirected evolutionary process? And I'll give you my response. This is the question that I'll get. You know, everybody, everybody, accepts that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs, and that happened by a process that involved no mind or intelligence. So a little bit of an exaggeration, right? It's obviously not everybody, but... It's a, it's a climate of opinion statement, yeah. right? You know, the sort, of thing that, the sort of thing that people say when they feel they've got the majority view mm -hmm. behind them. Why don't you believe like everybody else? Exactly, exactly. And implicit in this question is that I'm being willfully stubborn by rejecting what they call the evidence. Mm -hmm. And my response goes like this. No, I'm not being willfully stubborn. I'm being a good empiricist. Empiricism is the philosophy of science that says, look at the evidence. The evidence is the most important dimension to any scientific investigation. I would think that's what science should always do. Of course. That's, that is the soul of science, if you will, following the evidence. So my response is, how do you know, to this evolutionary biologist, that it was an undirected process? Undirected in the sense that no intelligence was involved. Secondly, Let's look at the evidence. So let's do that right now. Let's look at the evidence about the origin of birds and what would be required to build a creature that can really fly, not just glide, really fly. So we're going to be scientists right now, and we're going to examine the evidence. That's right. The, the motivating insight for both of us will be, is it evidentially based, or is it based on a philosophical assumption? That is this view that the origin of birds happened by an undirected evolutionary process. So, 
What do we need? Well, the first thing we need to recognize is that I'm not alone in doubting this undirected premise. Andreas Wagner is an evolutionary theorist at the University of Zurich. Very interesting guy. If you look at his work, over the past decade, he's argued that this assumption of lack of direction or randomness actually flies in the face of our normal experience. So in this paper that he published in 2011, he said, we know that the complex functional systems in our experience, like computers or airplanes, don't benefit from undirected changes. The insight that he's working off is the following. If you have a complex system, like even this little remote here, it occupies a tiny neighborhood where it actually works in a very much larger space where it doesn't. And undirected or random changes are much more likely to move this system away from its functional neighborhood into the bigger space where it won't work at all. So let's just look at some examples here. These systems, and we know this from our experience, they would not benefit from undirected changes. For instance, no one gets on an airplane, passenger airplane, and wants to hear that there have been, let's say, a dozen undirected random changes to the flight control system. And the pilot says cheerfully, you know what, we're going to take off anyway. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he would be a pilot very long. No. And the people would be heading for the exits rather <laughs> quickly. So, I mean, you look at this, this MRI unit or this precision scale or the grandfather clock or the fighter jet. Again, we know from experience, this is evidentially based, that undirected changes to complex systems like this are overwhelmingly likely to damage them and to destroy their functions. So this, the first flying machine that we actually came up with as human beings, the history of this system was not undirected at all. The Wright brothers worked very, very hard to figure out how to control heavier than air craft like this. And you know, it's interesting and actually rather sad and tragic. If you look in the late 19th century, a number of intrepid explorers paid with their lives Literally, they died gathering the knowledge that enables you and me to get on a plane and not give it a second thought. What the Wright brothers did successfully for the first time was get one of these craft up in the air, fly it around, and get it back down without killing themselves. Hmm. And they were looking for principles. In fact, these three principles govern all heavier than aircraft, whether it's a little Piper Cub or a great big 747. They all have to have lift. That is something that will keep them up in the air, but that's not enough. You can have lift with a hot air balloon, but you have no control. They all have to have thrust. That is some way to move the thing through the air, but that's not enough. You have lift and thrust, and if you have no control, you're going to crash. What they really discovered that was innovative was three-axis control. Being able to orient yourself in space along three axes, the Fancy names are pitch, roll, and yaw, right? You can see them here with respect to their flying, flying machine. If you've got these, lift, thrust, and three-axis control, you can fly. And that's what they did. But they didn't do, do so by accident. They knew what the target was. And in fact, when you read Wright's letters to the Smithsonian, as he was thinking about this, he said, we know that birds do it, and they're not doing it by magic. They have lift, thrust, and three-axis control. So if they're not doing it by magic, we should be able to do it too. In any case, these craft, various fighter jets, other kinds of, of aircraft, all follow those principles. And the engineering required to make these systems operate correctly is the antithesis of undirected processes. No one at Boeing or at McDonnell Douglas, puts their engineering work out to randomness, right? They hire people trained spe with special skills and training to follow the principles that the Wright brothers found to enable flight. And they, so, they found these principles just by studying the, the reality of the situation, what it took 
to get this craft into the air and to keep it in the air and then, like you said, to land it without killing anybody. Without killing you. Um, so they're looking at the, the real state of things. It's not a philosophy. It's looking at the evidence, it's right? Looking, looking at, at the, the facts. Evidence. And in fact, what's so striking to me about the Wright brothers in particular is they began their investigations. They began their research with birds. They began by, mm. in a sense, reverse engineering living things and saying, well, if they can do it and they're not doing it by magic, we should be able to do it too. It reminds me of that um, quote from Isaac Newton, I'm just thinking God's thoughts after him. Didn't he say that about his science? All of his, his work, I'm just trying to think God's thoughts after him. Exactly. And to look at a bird to see how God has made a creature fly successfully seems to me to be a pretty good way to go. That's right. So if we take our knowledge and our experience of our controlled flight, why should the principle be any different here? Where this system is vastly more, and a whole universe uh, of, of sophistication greater than what we do, because this system, this eagle, they make more of themselves, all right? <laughs> our airplanes don't make more of themselves, right? So why should our, the reasoning that we use with respect to what we do be any different when we look at a natural system like this? It has always struck me, Paul, that uh, one of the... Th um, theories from the evolutionists is to look at a creature like that that we couldn't even begin to make and say, well, that happened by itself. And yet, you know, airplanes and, and hang gliders and helicopters and things that we can make takes a great deal of design and intelligence and uh, preciseness and all of that. So one's, but in comparatively speaking, we can't even come close to making that. Yeah, the, the, as, as you're going to see in just a moment with a little video clip I brought, the sophistication of this system just defies description with respect to what we do. So I think you're right. There's a deep inconsistency logically in the comparison. These requirements have to be specified for any living thing plus a lot more. So this is for birds as well as... For airplanes. The same principles apply. Mm. So for instance, the lift and thrust in birds is combined in the same feature, namely the wing, but the wing is made possible only because of structures like feathers. I actually brought a feather today. We'll look at it in just a bit. When you examine feathers closely, they have internally very, very carefully engineered structures to keep themselves light and strong. Uh, so actually, Here's the clip. Let's watch it. Birds are covered by several types of feathers. Closest to the skin, a soft, thick coat of down provides excellent insulation. And the down is encased by multiple layers of contour and primary feathers. These outer layers give a bird its streamlined shape, protection from moisture, and the ability to maneuver freely in the air. To do so, they must be light, strong, and extremely flexible. When a Canadian goose approaches a pond, the long primary feathers on its wingtips bend and twist open like a Venetian blind. Simultaneously, the alula, three feathers attached to a small bone, is raised to create a slot that alters the path of turbulent air rushing over the wing. The precise actions of these mechanisms prevent stalling while slowing the bird's descent for a controlled soft landing. Now, when I see something like that, I say that's design, but Let's go back to my conversation with an evolutionary biologist. He has a rejoinder. He's got to come back to that. He'll say, look, natural selection accounts for the design that we see. He'll acknowledge that there's some form of engineering there, otherwise the bird wouldn't be flying. But he says you can't refer that or explain that by an intelligent cause because we know natural selection does it. I've got a response to him, so I've got an answer to this rejoinder. Well, let's hold that right there. When we come back, Paul's answer, Intelligent Design's answer to the evolutionist challenge. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. Paul Nelson, who's been sharing some fascinating things about the genius of birds. We've been discussing, have birds learned to fly by accident, by random mutations, or is there some design? Let's pick it back up. Paul? Well, I get a response from evolutionary biologists when I say that I don't accept the theropod to bird story. They say, well, look, you're just being stubborn. We've got a mechanism, natural selection, that will build the structures, the functions and behaviors needed for genuine flight. I keep this above my desk, all right? Little feather, about four inches long, just to remind me what would be required to engineer something like this, yeah. okay? It's remarkably light. I mean, you can feel that. It's just nothing oh, yeah. to it. It's but hollow. It, it's hollow, but it's incredibly strong, and it provides lift. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, I can go to the evolutionary literature and ask, where is the explanation for the origin of a structure like this? If natural selection really does it, not just in imagination, but in fact, I should be able to find that explanation in the literature of evolutionary biology. Here's what I do find. This theory, all right, this is the mechanism of natural selection. It's a good solid formulation. This actually happens, and there are three steps involved. The first one is you have to have variation. There have to be differences in the species on which natural selection can act. And then those differences, the second condition here called selection, they need to change reproductive output. Because the way that natural selection operates is creatures that have favorable variations, they're favorable in the sense that they increase the reproductive output of that particular member of a population or a species. And you have to be able to pass them on to your offspring. Oh, do they have any examples where they see that sort of thing happening? Not for something like the origin of this. For something like antibiotic resistance or resistance to heavy metals for a plant that happens to be near a, a mine site, we have examples of natural selection in action but not for something like building a feather. And there's a reason for that. The kinds of variations that you would need to fundamentally modify the body plan, let's say of a theropod dinosaur, those variations tend overwhelmingly to be destructive to the creatures in which they occur. So they need to turn like a dinosaur's arm or leg, right, into a feather or... Into a wing or, or into, you know, change the structure, change the bones, change the ligaments, change the musculature add these, but add them in a way that they'll give lift. And furthermore, you've got to have the associated behaviors. Flying is not a simple thing to do. It's not just running and jumping from the ground up. It's not jumping out of a tree and hoping you're going to fly, <laughs> right? Uh, there is a whole associated set of complex behaviors to use your wings in a way that's controlled. So not just the physical changes in the bird, but there has to be sort of mental changes, right? Instinctual changes. Instinctual changes, behavioral changes. Mm. And when I look for the evidence, remember, we're focusing on the evidence itself. When I look for the evidence that would say this process, right, which is real, actually built these kinds of structures and the associated behaviors, it's just not there. So Do I asked... Do they have anything in the fossil record that they point to? Well, or? there are interesting uh, dino, uh, dinosaurs that are extinct now that appear to have a, something like a feather, but it wasn't a true flight feather. It was probably for insulation. Who knows what it was for? But what's really more important than the fossil record is actual experimental evidence or observational evidence that these kinds of mutations can occur uh, can change reproductive output, and can be passed on. That's actually what natural selection itself requires evidentially. So in being a skeptic of the dino to bird theory, I'm being a good evolutionary biologist. I'm saying, look, show me the data. Show me the evidence. I'm not going to accept it just because you say so. Mm. The reality of the situation is that all science rests on a philosophical foundation. And it turns out that that foundation is very, very important to the kind of science that you do. So if an evolutionary biologist tells me everybody accepts natural selection, my question to him is why? Yeah. Is it because of the evidence or is it because of an underlying philosophical assumption that you've made? Mm. So let's step back a little bit and say, you know, where is this evidence that the process by which birds came to be was an undirected evolutionary 
scenario. And that's natural selection, right? Undirected. There's it's no undirected. mind involved. Darwin insisted on that. In his correspondence with uh, people like the Harvard botanist Asa Gray, who was a Christian, Asa Gray pressed him on this point. He wanted Darwin to acknowledge that maybe mutations, they didn't have that word, but variations were not undirected, not random, but guided by God. Darwin resisted that. And it's clear from history that Darwin was concerned not just to give us a theory about the origin of species, but actually to change the way that science itself was done. Mm -hmm. So in this passage from the historian and philosopher of science, David Hull at Northwestern University, David Hull points out that Darwin was concerned to promote a particular view of science, to change actually the rules by which science was conducted. That doesn't sound very scientific, if I can say so, um, to try to change the way it's done rather than to look at the evidence, look at the facts, and make your conclusions based on those. Well, it's human nature. It's the reality. When, when we have a theory like evolution, there's the theory about us, about where we came from. Philosophical and theological convictions come into play. And, in fact, you can see this when you read commentators like Ernst Mayer at Harvard. He says... What's the real core of Darwinian theory? The real core is that we can eliminate design, right? Prior to Darwin, people looking at birds would say that was caused by an intelligence. And that seemed to them to be a rational inference, a rational conclusion from what nature herself gave us. Darwin himself never said he was an atheist. When atheists would ask him to declare his his loyalty to atheism, to run his colors up the flag as an atheist, he declined. And there's good evidence that really probably through the whole of his life, he believed in some kind of a deity. If God exists, he's quite remote from our experience. He set up the universe in such a way that natural laws and chance would give rise to living things. An impersonal God who creates an independent universe. Exactly, exactly. And we can see this same philosophical viewpoint when we come right up to the present. So Jim Shapiro, who's a microbiologist at the University of Chicago and an acquaintance of mine, in his writings on this question, he says, this elimination of design is not surprising. Evolutionary biologists insist on randomness and accident because they want to exclude a supernatural agent from explanations of how we came to be. So Shapiro, who you could call a non-Darwinian evolutionist, he's an, he accepts evolution but not the Darwinian story for it, mm -hmm. is quite conscious here in this passage that there is a role for philosophy in how we come to evaluate theories, specific theories, like where did this come from, okay? So I think it's important for the viewers to realize that science doesn't float free of these underlying assumptions philosophical and theological assumptions. They play an active role in how we evaluate theories. Well, what an important point that is to make. I think so often we look at science and we think, well, here's something that's purely objective. Objective. We have these professionals. They're just telling us what's true. And what you're saying is they're human beings like everybody else. Exactly. There's more to the story. And, uh, you know, we often make a distinction between the intellect and the heart where at a deeper level, our emotions, our desires, our goals are, are sort of embedded. I think there's a constant interaction between the two. And the theories that people accept as rational, there's often a, a, an element that isn't strictly logical, but it's perfectly real. And it has to do with what the Bible calls our heart. You know, it reminds me, and I, I know we don't bring in scripture a lot when we're talking just about the scientific design, but I can't help but think of Romans where it says suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and uh, not know, you know, knowing God and yet suppressing that truth instead of being claiming to be wise, they became fools and they worshiped the creature and the creeping thing and the uh, cattle and the beasts. Rather than the creator. Rather, rather than the creator. So I, I'm encouraging the viewers to be realistic about the human dimension of science. And in a sense, it's also an aspect of science that's wonderful because our creativity helps us to build theories that do things for us, but it can also drag us down. You know, it seems to me that we have to do that. Our hopes, our dreams, our desires, our beliefs, and, you know, things that we don't want to acknowledge. That's right. Are also there. And if we believe what scripture says about the heart of man, that he, 
Uh, the unconverted man doesn't want to acknowledge his creator. He doesn't want to uh, do that because he has a vested interest. He knows he's guilty. That's right. We, we bring all of this to everything in our daily lives, including science. So you can't really separate religion from science in the sense that everybody who's doing science is a human being and by definition, he's got some view of religion as well. He's got a worldview that he's bringing to the question. Well, wonderful. I really appreciate you joining us Thanks. this week. It's always a treat to be here. And I thank you for joining us. I hope that you uh, enjoyed today's program where we looked at do birds, something as phenomenal as a creature that flies, do they get that ability randomly through an undirected process? Or is there a creator? Is there evidence? Is there compelling evidence for design? And design means a designer, which is just what we find in Scripture, who we know ultimately is God. You know, it just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true, and the proof is all around you. Join us next time for Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1802, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.